Who said this? The world looks at me as a football player who's a Christian, but I look at the world and say, I'm a Christian who happens to play football. Reggie White certainly would have said that. <laughs> who most recently said that? Tim Tebow. A year ago, June, Qualcomm Stadium, San Diego, David Jeremiah's church was having a big rally. Tim Tebow made that statement. I'm a Christian who happens to play football. Okay, who said this? I am not a role model. Just because I can dunk a basketball doesn't mean I should raise your kids. Right, we all know that one. <laughs> Charles Barkley, one of the most famous Nike commercials ever made. So David Jeremiah asked Tim Tebow, do you see yourself as a role model? Here was his answer. There are a lot of role models out there. There just aren't very many good ones. To me, that's so frustrating because you have in today's society so many famous athletes in baseball, basketball, football, and golf, every sport there is. If we come together to be great role models, it would be amazing to see how the next generation turns out. Well, Tim Tebow has done something that very few people get to do. He's actually added a verb to the English language. What do we call it when you bow and kneel and do that? What is that? That's T-bowing. All right, from the newspaper account of his time in Qualcomm Stadium, quote, I loved how genuine he was, said Tracy Cox of Santee. She attended the event with her extended family who she described as football fans and Christians. Her mother-in-law, Sharon Cox, added, he loves the Lord so much. There's no embarrassment when he drops to his knees. Let those two words sink in for just a moment. No embarrassment. No embarrassment to be public about your faith. No embarrassment, no matter what his critics say. No embarrassment, even when he is derided. No embarrassment. It was the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard who said it this way, with God's help, I will become myself. I dare say that without God's help, you will never become myself who you were really meant to be. Of all the questions of life, maybe there is no harder question than this. Do you know who you are? Do you know who you are? Until you can answer that question, you'll never really know where you fit in. And listen to this. Once you know who you are, you can fit in anywhere. Just a reminder of where we are in the story. When last we left our hero, he'd been thrown into the pit by his brothers who first hated him and then envied him and then plotted against him, conspired against him, threw him in the pit. We're going to kill him. We're going to abandon him, sold him to the desert traders laughed, I suppose, as he went off marching in their hands, enslaved down to Egypt, sold on the slave market, purchased by a man named Potiphar. And when you come back to the story, Genesis 39, here is the situation. Joseph is in Egypt. His brothers have abandoned him. His father thinks he is dead. It would be hard to find a more hopeless situation than that. Now, we all know, we all know, Genesis 39 is all about Joseph's encounter with Potiphar's wife. Whenever we preach on this, we almost always 
come to this verse from the New Testament about temptation. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man, but God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but will with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. This is the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Joseph's encounter with a woman who wanted him to go to bed with her. Joseph's battle with sexual temptation. Just a word here. Temptation is one of those topics, again, we talk around. We don't talk about very much. Maybe not as much as we should. Let me give you my definition. No attempt here to be technical, just simple and clear. Temptation is the inner urge to do wrong that hits us in the place of our own personal weakness. I find that helpful for three reasons. Number one, it emphasizes that temptation ultimately comes from the outside. You can say whatever you want about circumstances. You can say whatever you want about pressure from other people. You can say whatever you want about satanic influences or whatever the demons may be doing it. You may, you may say what you want about DNA and inherited things, but in the end, temptation comes from the inside. And it hits us in the worst place possible, which means that there are some things that bother you don't necessarily bother me. Some things I struggle with may not be an issue for you. Your weakness and mine almost certainly are not exactly the same. You know what else it means? It means that, uh, means that uh, you can come to chapel and uh, <clears throat> there can be a battle raging inside you no one else would know about. Mm. I learned about this this way. After I graduated from Dallas Seminary, I went right out into the pastorate. I spent 26 years in the pastorate, in Los Angeles, in Dallas, in Chicago. To be more clear about it, I went right out of here and I started preaching. And I basically preached nonstop for 26 years. I, I hardly, I preached every chance I got, every place I got. I think in 26 years, I missed three, four, five, maybe five Sundays in 26 years because I was sick. I just preached all the time. And then in 2005, for a variety of reasons, the Lord <clears throat> led us to take a step of faith. And we moved from the heart of Chicago down to a cabin in the woods, nine miles north of Tupelo, Mississippi. And there we were in a cabin in the woods behind a cattle gate, the end of a gravel road, way out there by a pond in the forest by ourselves. And for six months, I didn't preach on Sunday morning. I did a few I did a few things here and there during the week. But for six months, I didn't preach at all. What I mean to say is, I went from Dallas Seminary to preaching all the time for 26 years, and then I went for six months and didn't preach at all. And I thought it would really bother me. I thought I wouldn't be used to it, but actually, I enjoyed, I enjoyed that uh, six months. I learned a lot from it. Uh, you know what? This is the main thing I discovered. I discovered that uh, the world looks a lot different in the pew. <laughs> I had no idea. Sermons seem a lot longer in the pew than they do <laughs> behind the pulpit. I never preached a long sermon in my life as far as I was concerned. And I was shocked, I was stunned that when I was sitting in the pew, how quickly my 
sanctified mind would wander. And I discovered to my great dismay, you could be sitting right in front of the preacher. You could have your Bible open. You could be looking right at him and your mind could be 10,000 miles away. They never told me that in seminary. I was, I was dismayed, dismayed with how quickly my own righteous mind would wander. I guess what I'm saying is, in this room today, you have come for a lot of different reasons. Your minds are a lot of different places. I'm glad you're here. Uh, I understand you have pressures. Issue of sexual faithfulness is a big issue. So I uh, graduated in 78. Most of the guys I graduated with, I've never seen again. Most of my class, a few here and there, but we just scattered like most classes do. Most of the guys I graduated with, I have not seen in 35 years. We reconnect now with Facebook, right? But <laughs> so I got an email from a guy I haven't seen. He was a classmate of mine. I don't today, I don't exactly know where he is, but he wrote me out of the blue and said, hey, Ray, remember me? I did. And he said, he said, uh, how are you doing? How's Marlene? How's your family? So on. So I wrote him back and I said, I'm still married. We're happy. We're doing good and, and so on. And this is what he wrote me back. Quote, in this world of ours, it is never a sure thing, never to be assumed that a DTS grad or pastor is continuing in the faith. I have heard too many horror stories of broken marriages and wrecked ministries. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why he wrote that. I don't know what made him say that. I don't know what he was thinking about. I'll tell you one thing, I know it's true. Just because you graduated from DTS doesn't mean you are immune to any sort of temptation. So I now make three observations from this familiar story. Number one, when things are going well, be on guard. This is how Moses puts the matter in Genesis 39. The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes, that is in Potiphar's eyes, and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and entrusted to his care everything he owned. From that time that he made him overseer in his house over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. If you're counting, that's five times in four verses, it is said, the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord blessed Joseph. The Lord gave Joseph success. So much so that a pagan man like Potiphar saw the hand of God on Joseph's life. By the way, I just stop here to make a quick observation. Lost people are not stupid. They're lost, but they're not stupid. They don't, uh, they can't spell premillennial. If we didn't have spell check, we couldn't spell it either. They don't understand the Trinity. We struggle some with that too, you know. But I tell you this much about lost people, they can spot a phony a mile away and they recognize spiritual reality when they see it. Potiphar understood there was something different about Joseph. Second thing here, there is no contradiction between God's blessing and your temptations. After all, 
when things are going good, isn't that the time when you are most likely to be hit? So the lesson is clear. When everything is going your way, when you've got the world by the tail on a downhill slide, when you've just gotten called to a church, when your church is growing, when you've just built a big building, when your popularity's never been higher, when you've just written a book or started a radio ministry, when your dreams are starting to come true, watch out, be careful, take nothing for granted. Okay, that's number one. That's number one. Be careful. Be careful. When things are going well, be on guard. Observation number two. When you are tempted, remember who you are. Remember who you are. Well, we don't know her name. Mrs. Potiphar. You know, uh, we would say today she was a single married woman. Almost, almost all the Bible expositors who come to Genesis 39 say the same thing, and I'm going to say the same thing too. I doubt Joseph was the first time. You just read this story, and you say to yourself, this doesn't seem like the first time this would have happened. Joseph is tall and handsome and good-looking, and he's capable, and he's confident, and he has Potiphar's full confidence, and the, the blessing of the Lord is upon him, and, and, he, and he moves well and shows himself well. And so Mrs. Potiphar takes a look at him. She says to herself, I, I want that young man. Verse 7 lays out the situation for us with unabashed directness. After a while, his master's wife... That's Mrs. Potiphar. After a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. That doesn't really need any interpretation, does it? That's clear enough, right? Right? Right. That's, that's right. I mean, we don't have to that's a, do a lot of exegesis here. I want you to come to bed with me. Now, she raised up her eyes and looked at him. The living Bible, old living Bible says, she made eyes at him. <laughs> I don't know. But she wasn't subtle about it. He didn't want to. He wouldn't do it. So she decided to try to wear him down. Verse 10 says, and she spoke to Joseph day after day. He would not listen to her to lie beside her or to be with her. And you stop, you just ask yourself a question. I mean, he's far from home. His brothers have abandoned him. His father thinks he's dead. He's cut off from, 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 from all of his tradition. He's cut off from his family. He's a red-blooded man. I mean, he's a young guy. He's in, the, he's in the prime of his life. Why wouldn't he sleep with her? Verses 8 and 9 suggest two important answers. Number one, he was loyal to his boss. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in this house. Everything he owns, he is entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. So number one, he respected. He respected Potiphar. So he wouldn't sleep with Potiphar's wife. Number two, here's the real reason. Now we're getting down to short rows. Into verse 9. He was loyal to God. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Joseph did the right thing because he knew that adultery was wrong. Look in the text. The text is crystal clear. He called it a wicked thing and a sin against God. These days we like to rename sin. Make it sound less sinful. Instead of a hard word like adultery, we use words like affair and tryst and fling and one night stand and hooking up. We even call it making love. So I was thinking about this. And I was thinking about, I was thinking about how in our society and our culture, 
wants to redefine everything. I was thinking about um, the Supreme Court and the gay marriage controversy spreading across the country, coming soon to a town, city, church near you. It's a big, probably the biggest, probably the biggest moral conundrum facing the evangelical church here at this point in the 21st century. You know what I thought about? I pondered all of you, pondered all of you. You know, um, I went back, I got to thinking about my days here at Dallas Seminary, four years I spent here. Marlene and I got married on Thursday night in Phoenix, Arizona. We honeymooned by driving to Dallas, <laughs> where I started my first semester of my first year the following Tuesday morning. I do not recommend that. <laughs> we survived barely. And I walked in here. This Lamb Auditorium looked a lot different back then, but I walked in here, and I thought I had Bruce Walkie right out of the box. I didn't know a, I didn't understand anything. S. Lewis Johnson, I didn't understand anything. And Dr. Honer, I didn't understand anything they were talking about. It was just so far over me. And I thought about the men who were here in that day, Dr. Walford and Dr. Ryrie and Dr. Toussaint and Dr. Pentecost, who I guess had already been here 30 years when I showed up, you know? <laughs> and John Whitmer and Dr. Leitner and Fred Howe and Roy Zook and Prof. Hendricks. Uh, I've already said S. Lewis Johnson and Zane Hodges. Those were lively days at the seminary. Uh, you know, to say it that way may, may make it sound as if I'm just some old guy, nostalgic for the good old days. Well, I, I wouldn't be surprised if when you get out of here, you look back on your four years here and say, that was the best four years in the history of Dallas Seminary. I think you ought to feel that way about it. And I'm very happy about the four years I spent here, but I want you to know, I think the faculty you've got here, I think the property you've got here, the buildings you've got here, the technology you've got here, the amazing diversity of the faculty and staff and the, the, all the things that, that, that you have here, the potential for the education, it's, there's never been a better day for Dallas Theological Seminary than this very day right now. So I'm not looking back into the past as if I'm looking back into the good old days. But you know what I thought about all those great giants of the, of the faith and great men of God and great, great, great Bible teachers and all of that? I was here for four years. Nobody said one word in four years about gay marriage. Not one word. I never heard it. Never heard it mentioned. Never heard it taught. Never heard it answered. Never heard it discussed. And you know, you think about, you, you go back to the, the founding of the seminary. And uh, can you imagine if you went to Dr. Lewis Sperry Chafer and you said to him, so what do you think about two guys getting married? He'd go, what kind of Tom Fool question is that? <laughs> hmm. Believe it or not, I'm actually trying to make a point here. <laughs> In typical preacher fashion, I'm going around the corner to do it. But think about this. Way back in the last century when I was a student here, we spent four years. I never heard a word about what is today the great moral issue of our generation. And I guess the shocking thing about whole thing about homosexuality and, and gay marriage is not that it's happened, it's how fast it's happened. It's the, it's the rate of cultural change in our society. And I want you to know something. Not S. Lewis Johnson, not Dr. Ryrie, not Dr. Walford, not Zane Hodges, not Prof. Hendricks. I mean, back when I was here, none of them talked about that. But but they did talk about 
going back to the Bible and standing on the Bible and believing the Bible, let me tell you something. When you guys get out of here five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you're going to face issues that are not being talked about today. And I'll tell you what, I don't think you're going to have to wait any 35 years for whatever those issues are going to be because the rate of cultural change is accelerating. So let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. I got it when I was here and I'm happy to pass it along. Just do what Joseph did. Go out and call Bible things by Bible names. He didn't mess around with Potiphar's wife. He called it what it was, a wicked thing. He said, this is a sin against Almighty God. So when you guys graduate, go out into the great big world and the challenges that face you, please remember what you were taught here and call Bible things by Bible names. I think you'll turn out okay. Okay, the third thing. The third thing. When you do right, the world may not reward you, but God will. One day, when he went into the house to do his work, none of the men of the house were there. She caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. She grabbed him. She grabbed him. She started to pull him down. Come on, honey. And she tried to pull him on down to the, to, to the lounge with her, to the bed, to the couch. What are you going to do then when she's grabbing you and pulling you down? Listen, Joseph knew he belonged to God. When a man knows he belongs to God, it makes the decisions of life easier if you belong to God. You can't sleep with your boss's wife. It's just that simple. It doesn't matter if she's lonely or attractive or available or anything else. You just can't do it. Period. End of discussion. Uh, no discussion needed. He didn't mess around. He didn't flirt with trouble. He didn't say, how far can I go? He just said no. And he didn't apologize for saying no. And he didn't worry about hurting her feelings. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. It's all or nothing. Either he sleeps with her or he loses his job. King James Version uses a quaint expression to describe how Joseph responded to the final seduction. He left the garment in her hand and fled and got him out. <laughs> Why does it say he got him out? Because no one else could get him out, so he got himself out of trouble. He was first courteous, then cautious, then courageous, or maybe crazy, but he stayed cool and got out clean. When she said, did you like that? When she said, when she said, why don't you stay for a while? He said, I'd love to, but I got to run. And that's exactly what he did. Out the door, across the lawn, over the hedge, dodging camels as he went. He left her holding his coat in her hand. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Listen, listen, you got to make up your mind in advance, right? It's too late to pray about it. When Potiphar's wife is playing kissy face with you, there's a time to talk and a time to stop talking. There's a time to stay and a time to go. There's a time to walk and there's a time to run. And as the great theologian taught us, you got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. When temptation comes, you got to move fast. God is not obligated to give you a second chance to get out clean. He promised you a way out. But he didn't promise you a second or a third one if you didn't like the first one he offered. Potiphar's wife, as you can imagine, not too happy. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. So while Joseph is running half-dressed across the countryside, she's left with nothing but a handful of dirty laundry. This is not a good thing. Two things happen in short order. Number one, she makes a false accusation. Basically, she accuses him of rape. With a little touch of racism, she accuses him of rape, essentially, and calls him this Hebrew in verse 15. Second, he's unjustly imprisoned. 
So there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is you can resist temptation. The bad news, you may lose your popularity in the process. The world crucified Jesus. Why should you and I expect to get off any easier? End of the story, verse 21. The Lord was with him. Ah, uh -huh. he's in prison now. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those in prison. He was made responsible for all that was done there. Warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. At the moment, into this story, Joseph is chained in a filthy pit. Because of his faithfulness to God, he's lost his job, his freedom, and his reputation. He appears to be a ruined man. You know what this story proves? This story proves God honors those who dare to say no. It may not appear that way at first. Things may not work out exactly the way we think. But when we have the courage to say no to temptation and yes to God, he will take care of the details. In the end, you will never be sorry you obeyed God. Never. Remember. Remember. It's always better to do right the first time. There are some things worse than going to jail for doing right. One of them is living in the prison of a guilty conscience. It's better to do right and sleep well than to toss and turn because you couldn't say no. You know what? You stand back and look at Genesis 39. There's a beautiful symmetry here. In the beginning, the Lord was with him. In the ending, the Lord was with him. And the Lord gave him the courage to do right in the middle. How did he do it? Joseph knew who he was. He came from a godly family. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. He came from a godly family. And even though he was far from home, abandoned by his brothers, father thought he was dead. He knew who he was. He remembered what he'd been taught. That was a settled issue. Even though he was a teenager, he knew he belonged to God. That made his decision easy. So four great don'ts. Number one, don't forget who you are. Number two, don't be surprised when temptation comes knocking at your door. Number three, don't be deceived by persuasive voices. And number four, don't be confused by the immediate results. Eleven years ago, eleven years ago, I spoke here for this series back in 2002. In one of my messages, I said, what this generation needs, what Christians in America need, what we need is three words, tenacious, winsome courage. Tenacious, winsome courage. I want you to know, I believe that like 10 times stronger now, 11 years later. Tenacious, winsome courage. Tenacious, we won't give up. Courage, we won't back down. Winsome, we make our stand with a smile, not with a frown. I am not a prophet, nor the son of a prophet. But as I see the moral decay, collapse, calamity in our country, I believe that things are going to get worse before they get better. We better toughen up. In times like these, we need an infusion of the Joseph spirit so that we will do what he did. He called Bible things by Bible names. He was thrown in jail because he was faithful. God honored him because he was faithful. Joseph did what he did because he knew who he was. Christian, do you know who you are? If you know who you are, you can serve Christ anywhere. May God give us a revival of the Joseph spirit in our own generation May God give us some young men and some young women who will stand for truth with tenacious, winsome courage. And may it start right here at Dallas Theological Seminary. Let's pray. Lord, we do not ask for an easy road, but for courage to walk the path you put in front of us. Thank you that our days are in your hands. We have nothing to fear because all of our days and all of our times are appointed by you. 
Give us the strong faith of Joseph. May our colors be clear so that everyone will know we belong to you. Grant us tenacious, winsome courage so that we will do right even when it would be easy to do wrong. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.